to a core that we are putting new old stock Brimars in these. And we've been having a little trouble with our new old stock. So that might be one of the Which is weird because I've put them in all of mine, the prototypes, the production ones, and everything, and I've never had one go bad. But tubes go bad. Yep. So, uh, having said all that, uh, I've played about a thousand gigs. That's definitely a tube. It's a preamp tube. Um, I, you've played this thing on a, on, a, on a million gigs in sessions and never had that happen. Uh, when we first started out doing the project, um, we got. Uh, we started out with a 30 watt amp that was had no master volume on it was so, uh, solid state rectifier um, in a little tuxedo cabinet totally different design than what we ended up with uh, and when we got this this version going we um, had some really interesting adventures where you know I, I was pushing Doug let's let's get the plate voltage happening let's make this thing sweat you know and he did it and I had a couple of instances where the two the power tubes actually broke off in a perfect circle. The caps broke off where the tube retainers went around them because they were so hot. So, uh, needless to say, we toned the heat down a little bit the voltage and then put two fans in the back of all of them. Um, but it's great to have that stuff happen in the in the uh, design process and not after they're already out there. Um, you know, it was really important for me to. Um, make sure that the amps were equally uh, road tested and studio tested. And I think that when you spend uh, $3,000 on an amplifier, I'm not sure how much they cost, but you ought to get an amp that's good that you can use on any gig and, and ought to be equally uh, usable in the studio, which is an issue I've had in the past with certain vintage amps uh, that sound kind of godlike if you're six, 10 feet in front of them. And then you take them into the studio and, the, and you have to keep moving the microphone around and you never quite get that experience of standing in front of the amp. Um, you know, a lot of old high-powered amps that we love have tons of low end and um, can be scooped in the mids. It just depends on the amp. But when you put a microphone in front of it, it picks up those accentuated frequencies and it doesn't always record very well. But these amps, I've had the experience time and again of just, you know, you just throw a mic anywhere near the center of the cone and boom, you've got a great, great sound, great tone. Um, so what we ended up with was two amps that have tube rectifiers, which is the first time PRS has done a tube rectifier, correct? Yes. Uh, I've had great amps over the years that have had tube rectifiers and had the experience quite often of having them be great in the in, in, in my bedroom or in my studio, have they record well, and then I take them on the gig, and when I really dig in, especially in a louder band, that tube rectifier sag uh, makes the amp kind of disappear, it kind of goes away. So what we str uh, strove for was that balance of the nice little bit of compression that a tube rectifier will give you, combined with an amp that does not cave in you know, in a live situation. So we tried to find that sweet spot, and then at the same time, we went, uh, we were really went for a, a gain structure where on a clean, uh, you could get almost a clean feedback, and it's something that you hear a lot, like on the Almond Brothers Live at Fillmore East, uh, Dwayne was able to sort of coax that thing out of his super bass. Um, you know, he didn't play super lead, he played a super bass. It was a different kind of EQ and different kind of gain structure than a lot of the marshals from that period. But I didn't, we didn't want to make a marshal. We wanted to make an amp that was unique, but still, that was one of the qualities I went, was going for, where the, that sweet spot in the gain structure where you could get that you know, in, sustained feedback where it goes into the upper harmonics, kind of like an old PA pickup. The same thing I went for in this guitar kind of went for in the amps too, something that would accentuate this, those qualities, that sort of magic swirl, if you will, that we all love. Um, where there's a bloom in the note and it kind of goes up, takes off into a real musical way. It's not an unpleasant overtone or um, anything that's not really truly musical. And then we went for uh, an EQ curve and a tone stack that would um, allow us, uh, allow me at least to, what I went for, normally try to achieve, is to get a really tight bottom end, clear low notes, a lot of bottom, 
but at the same time have the top notes be thick and creamy. And it's very, very hard to do that because if, to get one or the other, the other, if you get one, the other often suffers. It's hard to get uh, both those things happening at the same time. So that was a real, those three things were real crucial in designing these amps. Um, then when we did the 50, uh, I had the, uh, being somewhat of a Luddite when it comes to te technology, uh, you know, really again, once again, didn't want to make a, a, you know, your typical 50 watt clone, you know, Plexi Marshall or what, uh, High Water, all those amps that we love, you know, have grown up loving. Um, so in an effort to sort of do something different, my thinking cap was on, uh, tossing ideas around and I, and I asked Doug, I said, Doug, what would it be like to make a 50 watt amp but put four EL34s in it, two rectifiers and cathode bias? What, what could that be done? And um, for just the briefest of moments, he was like, are you out of your mind? Just, it was just like a, it's just a fleeting. Uh, and he says, yeah, man, let's, let me think about that. And so uh, in it, we ended up having to use two tube rectifiers, but there are four EL34s in the 50 watt amp. And what we ended up with uh, was an incredibly robust sounding amp that really has a lot of thump in, you know, in the chest. Um, it's definitely louder and moves more air than the 30. They both do their own thing equally well. Um, the master volumes work really well on both amps. They're both really musical, but I will say that the 50 is not for the faint of heart. It's not, you know, uh, if you're playing in a country band in a small little club, it's probably not the right choice. The 30, on the other hand, is, is uh, much more manageable volume-wise and um, has a few extra features on it, so they, they kind of fill a different niche for me. Um, on my new record that's coming out in December, um, they're the only amps I used on the entire record, and I was able to just get any tone and every tone out of these two amps. I could have done it with one of them if I wanted to, but um, you know, there are, there are times when I would play a solo where I wanted uh, maybe a little more compression, a little creamier thing, and I would use the 30, and then there were other times when I wanted to really just, you know, Billy Gibbons circa 1978, that, that those low notes that just jump through the speakers, and I would use the 50. Um, but they're both, they both were kind of designed to achieve the same goal, have the same feel in my hands, which is you know, a real important thing that I look for in an amp, is how does it translate? You know, what I hear in my head, how can I make it come out of the amplifier? When I, when I vary the string uh, finger pressure in my left hand, when I either I play with a pick or fingers with my right hand, all those things change the tone. And uh, when the amp is really responsive and working the way it feels good to me, I can do so much more. I can play less notes and feel like I'm doing more. I don't feel the need to, I don't have to like, I can slow down in a way, you know, I can dig in. It's a, it's, it's a very, um, I play more relaxed. Um, so I think we, I think we, you know, I think we got there, and I got the first production models last Friday. They showed up uh, in my house Friday about midday, and you know, until I actually played through those production ones, I wasn't sure where we we're gonna, if we we're gonna, where we we're gonna be. You never know. You know, I've been playing these prototypes for a long time, so the production ones did they change anything? Does it sound any different? And uh, I played through them both, and I was it was just like, wow, we did it. You know, it's very very. Very, very, a lot of gratitude for uh, the experience of being able to work with Doug and have his talent uh, and experience to draw on. Um, very, very, a lot of humility, a lot of very humble guy. So it was, it was very, very, uh, it was just a lot of fun.